Welcome to the World Economic Forum Bloomberg televised session. Today, as you can see, the title, Technology for Prosperity. I'm Stephen Engel. I'm the China television correspondent for Bloomberg Television. I've been here about seven years in China covering what has been an obviously dramatic transformation of this country. In fact, I've been in Asia for now 24 years. The first 24 years were in America, the next in, in Asia. Who knows about the next 24? Probably in Asia as well. This is my home. And I want to make a mention, too, because we're going to be talking about uh, technology, uh, kind of summing up what the last three days at the World Economic Forum have been discussing. Um, wide range of topics we can explore. But interestingly, it was 15 years ago that I got my first mobile phone. And I was a little bit late, uh, Luddite, in technology. But now look at me, okay? We have Blackberry. I have, what's this? iPhone 3. I have a portable charger. I have, what else here? I have too many things. I've been left to my own devices. I have a MiFi device. I have a mini iPad. <laughs> I have another iPad right here. I have too many devices. So we need to find a solution to that. And I know one of our guests has a little mini computer on his <laughs> wrist. So that's something we can talk about. Let's get to the discussion right away. And I want to make a mention as well, because I have all these iPads and everything, we have social media. So if you're uh, clued in, you can send us a social media message to hashtag futuretech or by email futuretech at wef dot ch and get your questions ready towards the end. Let's get this thing started. Ladies and gentlemen, our panelists here. Whoops, there go my devices. First to my right is Nathan Blacharsik. Chief Technology Officer and founder, co-founder of Airbnb. Next is Gao Ji Fan of Trina Solar. He is the chairman and CEO of the Solar Panel Maker. Paul Jacobs, executive chairman of Qualcomm. Probably a few of your products are in all these devices. I wanted to thank you for having so many devices. <laughs> <laughs> and at the end here is, of course, Repelong Rabana. She is the CEO and founder of Rekindle Learning out of South Africa. Thank you very much. Besides not having enough arms and pockets, what do you think the biggest mm. challenge is going to be for the next internet, the next mobile wave going forward? Why don't we, let's start with you down on the end. Sure. I don't really always see challenges around the mobile um, innovation space. I think that um, when I think about mobile and internet technology, I see a lot more empowerment coming out of it rather than um, the actual challenges. Particularly when I look at my own story as an entrepreneur, um, coming out of South Africa and Africa, I look at the fact that I started 22 out of university and within those eight years I can come to a platform like this. This wouldn't have been possible without technology and the, the elements of empowerment that it brings. And when I think about that empowerment, it's really around information, influence, and inclusion. And I'll sort of call those the three I's, because for me, information enabled us as a small group of entrepreneurs sitting at the bottom of Africa to develop software on a world-class platform. Um, and through that knowledge, build expertise, expand our circle of influence, and allow us to engage people to build a business and build a business on a platform that's used everywhere in the world, the same platform that's used here in China um, and in the US. And that inclusive nature of the internet is, is far more compelling for me than any of the negatives. Sure, there'll be some challenges, but you don't limit the growth of a child because of the freedom that's gonna come with it. The theme, of course, technology for prosperity, mm -hmm. and the internet can be a great equalizer, if you will, give somebody the head start, but there are costs, barriers to entry as well in developing nations. Definitely. I think when I think about what, what are the limits for us on, on the African continent, the, the cost of entry in terms of devices and internet access is still one of the biggest issues. And if we're really going to enable young people and enjoy the youth bars that's going to come out of the African continent, we must ensure that that access um, permeates through all aspects of the continent. Um, and that's why we've got um, big partners like him on our left hand side to ensure those kind of things will ultimately happen because we've got to ensure the access widens up. Let's move to Paul Jacobs of Qualcomm, a yeah, company so, that's making some prosperity in the internet well, and mobile space. Certainly. Uh, we spent $5 billion on research and development last year to try and 
do the things that you're looking for, which is to reduce the cost of the devices, uh, to increase the capability of these devices, uh, to spread coverage more broadly. I mean, today we have more than half of the human race has a phone. And there's 7 billion connections, but about 3.6 billion unique users. And about 2.2 billion of those are actually using mobile broadband. So we've already connected a lot of people to the internet, but clearly we want to get the rest of the people on the internet. And as you said, there's huge benefits to people, and benefits in entrepreneurship, benefits in healthcare, in education, in public safety, all these kinds of areas. And it's very motivating for our employees, by the way, to be involved in that and to work with a broad, broad range of partners uh, to make this, this a reality. So we definitely see the upside of, of connecting that many people and giving them access not just to each other but all sorts of information. And then as we look into the future about giving people information about themselves, for example, so that they can manage their health better and we can get you know, better productivity out of the health uh, healthcare industry. And to pick up on, wrap along what was saying about you know, the great equalizer, I understand I read that Qualcomm will be spending about $150 million on some Chinese mobile startups. What, what's the, the goal there? Right, so, well we do this around the world, um, but there's obviously a lot of innovation that's happening in China. We've got the 4G networks launching now, so people are very excited they're going to have higher data rates and more capabilities on their devices. And so looking for companies that can either build services on top of that or build technologies that will actually go into the next phones, whether it's sensors that you might have in the environment or on your body, the so-called Internet of Things that, uh, that we're very excited about. Um, there's a lot of opportunity here, I, I would say, and, and, and a lot of innovation. And we're very focused on working with Chinese companies. Right now, for example, we're, we're working actively with 90 different companies that are building uh, different devices. And, uh, and I see that only growing because the demand is quite strong. And there's still a very large market here in order to get more internet connectivity out to you know, kind of everybody in China. You want to get it out of the way and show off your watch? Oh, sure. Well, uh, so, so we built a, a smart watch also with a reflective display technology on it, so it's always on. You can see it outdoors. But what's very interesting about this is it goes with this notion that we have of extending human senses to another sense that would, be, that would allow you to perceive cyberspace more directly and interact with it wherever you are. So the notion is that I get notifications not just of phone calls and text messages, but when I walk into a room, I can get notifications of services that are available in that room, whether it's being able to use the microphone and speakers here. If I walked into a store, it would be about checking in. If I go into a sports stadium, it tells me which line to go to or where, it's, uh, where the bathroom is located or, or things like, you know, all the kinds of things that you might want to know about the world around you. And, and this gives me the opportunity to get notifications quickly and then swipe them away, as opposed to if I got it on my phone, I take my phone out, I type in my unlock code, and you know, it's 15 seconds per notification, whereas here I look down and swipe and it's gone. And so that's what we were doing with this. Now, for us, we're not a consumer product company. So we did a limited run of these, and now we have partners. Uh, Timex, for example, is launching a fitness watch based off the same kind of screen technology. I, so it's exciting. I hear that Cupertino, California companies come out with something too. Sure. So that's yeah, going to no, be a driver. I think wearable technology is going to be a, a huge thing for the future. Gao Jifan, what do you think? Have, are we too plugged in? Are our kids too plugged in right now? Too many devices. There's zombies walking down the streets. <laughs> They're playing mobile games into the wee hours of the night. Are we too connected? To start with, our company is not actually engaged in internet. Our company is a photovoltaic company, so we are a new energy company. As for the first question, I believe that internet has contributed hugely to the mankind. Let me just give you one example. In Africa, there were regions that had no power at all. So we installed separate uh, solar power generation systems. The first thing that they did was to charge their mobile phones. 
that shows mobile phone has enabled people to know knowledge around the world, and even some of them have been using this knowledge to start up their own companies. I've seen at present Vice President of Huawei. Huawei has been installing um, bases around the world, including in Africa. Absolutely, internet has narrowed gaps across the world, especially it has contributed hugely to people in the less developed countries, enabling them to enjoy uh, the most advanced information and technologies. Internet has connected the world at the same time in a more timely way. Well, yeah. However, on the other hand, I've heard one of my friends heading a software company, ISV, um, say to me that in the future, all the mobile devices will become another organ of the human body, like another eye, another hand. I was shocked by this view, because we cannot live without any integral organs, or we cannot live well, at least, uh, such as our eyes and our hands. But how about uh, making uh, mobile devices part of us? So we will be dependent on them. We cannot live without them. In other words, uh, we will be manipulated by the mobile devices we're using. Uh, once I heard a story in uh, China, once the CEO of uh, internet gaming uh, company made a speech about uh, how good his business is, but then after his uh, speech, a mother uh, got down on her knees, kneeled in front of him, saying that uh, my child is lost in internet gaming. And he didn't spend even a minute learning and doing other meaningful things. Please stop developing internet games. So yeah, mobile internet has de delivered uh, so many benefits to the mankind on the one hand. However, if used improperly, the same technology would do a lot of harm to us, human beings, physically and uh, psychologically as well. I'll come back to that as well, and I want to talk about China's role in the innovative process in a little bit. But let's bring up you, Nathan. Uh, a disruptive technology, would you, would you agree with that, Airbnb? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think. Um, I, I've heard the word platform mentioned uh, up here, and you hear a lot about technology platforms today, and I think um, how that's really relevant to what we're talking about is uh, technology well, platforms bring people together to uh, either better communicate uh, or transact services or goods. Airbnb is an example of this. Uh, it is a platform that allows individuals to rent out their homes or rooms in their homes to travelers. Uh, so it's enabling almost a, an entirely new type of economic uh, activity, and the way we think of our, our what we call hosts, our suppliers, as micro entrepreneurs. These are average, everyday people who are now empowered to sell something that they couldn't before. And so, when I think about what we've done as a company, we've given them a toolbox that they can use uh, for their own social good, whether that's providing an income or meeting people uh, from around the world. And so I think this is a very powerful idea that's not specific to Airbnb. It's also being called the sharing economy, um, the idea that we all have uh, excess things that we own or even time that through marketplaces and platforms we can offer to others uh, for, for economic gain, uh, but also a more connected, uh, socially connected world. How do you see disruptive technologies such as yours changing the regulatory framework as well, which can then lead to greater prosperity for startups like you? Well, these days, there's, there's, for the most part, regulation around every aspect of our lives. And a lot of these regulations were established long ago. Um, I think we'd all agree that over time, regulation uh, needs to adapt because our world is, is changing. Um, and so I think the challenge for policymakers is uh, how to go through that transition in a smooth way, because change is hard. It's hard to agree on change. Uh, I want to be clear. I think. In the future, though, we all want more sensible rules. Um, so no one's saying that there shouldn't be rules around the future of technology. There absolutely should be. Um, but we should also recognize that the world has changed, and we should uh, rethink what is sensible from the ground up. Gao Jifan, maybe you can comment on the, 
the perspective of doing business here in China. Obviously, we heard from Li Keqiang, he's saying innovation and the internet are very important, but there also has to be a, a strong regulatory environment. How do you see China's role in that, in having a, a stiff regulatory environment without stifling creativity? Well, over the recent years, Internet has been growing by leaps and bounds in China, including Internet finance and other Internet-centric business models. In this process, Internet has shrunken the distance between suppliers and uh, those who demand the, the uh, goods and the services uh, by disintermediating uh, lots of uh, services and industries is one of the biggest benefits of the Internet. It's far more efficient. However, at the same time, between supply and demand and across the value chain, across the spectrum between supply and demand, everything is based on Internet. So uh, how can we achieve credibility along this value chain? For, for, for example, for an e-commerce platform or other service platform based on the Internet, without credibility, without trust, the entire model would ultimately uh, collapse or otherwise it would hurt the end users, uh, the customers. In some extreme cases, there will be very negative consequences. So in this context, the regulators uh, should find ways to regulate this new environment. Uh, what is more important uh, is that we should ask the question, what capacity, what capabilities are requested, are required of the regulators to be able to well manage or regulate those new platforms? Um, because maybe sometimes the Internet play players are out-innovating the regulators. How can the regulators catch up with the Internet-based innovators? That's a big issue. And on the other part, uh, for the Internet players, in Internet companies themselves, uh, they should exercise some self-discipline and self-regulation with brisk development and growth of the Internet. Yes, the Internet uh, uh, players can expand their market, generating more income and revenue for them. Um, it's all the more natural for them to do so. But in order to achieve sustainability, those companies themselves should establish some uh, code of conduct or set of rules and ethics to manage themselves so as to make sure that all stakeholders would benefit from the platform with win-win scenarios instead of hurting the interest of some members of the platform. Otherwise, this platform would no longer be sustainable. Right now in China, in a number of different industries, including the video streaming industry, is it a broadcast under the broadcast regulator? Is it under the internet regulator? It's defining. And many companies are seeking you know, ways uh, to establish the rules in the industry before the rules are set. And it, it leads to what? On, yeah. on the counter side of that, though, as well, is that while we all want the good regulatory compliance, the flip side is that on the African continent, because of the public institutions still developing the regulatory framework, it's likely to better suit um, the new technologies that are coming out. And we've seen that a lot in financial services and the health sectors, where a lot of financial products are coming out that haven't emerged from developed markets, primarily because of the flexibility in that regulatory environment. Um, there's a particular company I know in, in South Africa that is, for example, providing completely unsecured loans purely on the basis of your mobile data, how often you purchase prepaid airtime and use it. Um, and without you requiring any kind of collateral models that previously haven't existed um, in sort of a developed environments and because of that flexibility in the regulatory environment we can see a lot of those innovations come through um, and I hope through that process we can develop better regulatory environments that suit the new technologies instead of trying to inherit ones for the traditional financial services industry. I, th I think one of the things that we've had this discussion about when we talk about technology providing prosperity is does it increase the divide? Do the haves get more and the have-nots get less? And I think this is a, a great example where a lot of innovation will happen in developing and emerging markets precisely because there's a lower regulatory burden. So when you look at the benefits of mobile health, 
A lot of things are happening in emerging markets that don't happen in developed markets. And kind of going to what you were saying earlier about mobile being part of you, I mean, there are huge benefits. We're working with the uh, uh, researchers right now who have built a device smaller than a grain of sand, and it will go inside your body, and it'll tell you two weeks ahead of time whether you're going to have a heart attack. Now imagine that, that kind of preventative medicine, and it's not just for heart attacks, it will also be for cancer, it will be also be for uh, diabetes and chronic diseases, all of these kinds of things, you'll get constant monitoring. Now where will that happen first? Is it going to happen in developed markets or is it going to happen in developing markets? And will that actually allow a leapfrogging effect to occur in the developing markets, which we have seen in communications technology as well as some of the other areas that you were just discussing? You make the chips, you also license the chips, you know the power that we can have, don't you? How, how much power are we giving up to the computers? Well, I mean, you know, if you, if you want to talk about things that are concerning, you know, Stephen Hawking is out with a paper talking about uh, artificial intelligence possibly being an existential threat. So we talk about this thing, the singularity, and whether uh, whether artificial intelligence will surpass humans. Um, the the near-term concern a lot of people express is will jobs be destroyed and not be created, and there's a lot of debate about that. But you, know, you, you can construct all sorts of uh, bad scenarios if you look out. You can construct them about that. You can construct them about uh, biotechnology enabling bioterrorism. Um, I think the key for us is to build the structures that prevent those kinds of things, build the technologies in such a way that we can mitigate those, those risks. Uh, but there's always some risk associated with new technologies. I think the key is to make sure that we accentuate the benefits instead of the downsides. Yeah, yeah I mean, to build off that, I'd say technology in the extreme is, is very powerful and potentially very dangerous. Um, however, I'd like to point out that enabling technology is a hard thing. You know, creating innovation, empowering innovation is a really hard thing. Uh, regulating innovation and how technology gets used is a relatively easy thing. It's easier to say no than it is to say yes and to create. And so I think, you know, that, that gives me hope about the future, whatever technology it is that we do create, uh, that it will be relatively easier to control that technology than it is to create that technology in the first place. Right. Uh, Paul was talking about the, whether these technologies can either widen the gaps in society or narrow them. It's interesting with your platform, you say it's, it's narrowing them because many of your hosts are low to med middle income yeah, I think individuals and they're becoming micro entrepreneurs, if you will. Right. So I, th I think the interesting thing about the way our society is developing is uh, increasingly to get the high paying jobs, you need to have a very specialized background. Right? You need to go to a certain school, you need to have a certain background in a technical field, um, and that leaves out a big part of the population. And I think you know, one thing to talk about there is how to train people to have those skills, but there will always be a broad set of this, the society that doesn't have those skills and thus is disenfranchised from the opportunities that are being created. You know, I think one of the interesting things about the sharing economy is that it allows regular people um, you know, irrespective of, say, education, uh, to participate. So in the case of Airbnb, if you have a home and you're willing to provide some hospitality, you can participate and benefit. And indeed, uh, our hosts on Airbnb are, are below the median income, and you see this happening. Um, but you see other people who are renting out their pets uh, and providing rides to people who need rides uh, and doing different types of tasks. So I think this is a powerful idea that could be a lot more inclusive than a lot of the kind of the innovation we've seen in, in other sectors. Are you afraid, though, you could be shut down in some places? There are other disruptive technologies like Uber, which have had their problems in various cities. Um, I would think the hotels association would be not too pleased with your disruptive technology. Are you afraid, though, there could be overarching regulation that well, will I, you I, persevere? I, I, <laughs> no one's saying there shouldn't be regulation. We, we want regulation as, as well. Um, again, I think it it's, needs to acknowledge, though, that uh, you know, it's now the 21st century, and so what are the rules that make sense in the 21st century? Uh, I think there's a very strong value proposition here for our guests, for our hosts, but also for cities uh, and building owners and even neighbors. Um, so I think 
The, the trick is to define how those different parties come to the table. I think the hard part in the short term is that these ideas are so new that people are just starting to hear about this, and the gut reaction is to apply the status quo. I mean, it's very easy, again, to say no. It's a lot harder to take the time to understand what is this change that's happening, and what is a new set of rules that would um, accomplish greater good for everybody. Gal Jifan, maybe we can bring the conversation back to prosperity. Uh, you're in an industry, in the solar panel industry, that's had a lot of difficulty over the last few years. The most recent quarter, there's been a pickup as they've, as they've worked off the excess demand. How do you move from just being a manufacturer to implementing the innovations that you're going to have within your company and going up the food chain and being profitable consistently? Well, in terms of uh, solar PV technology, it's fair to say that uh, it generates uh, electricity out of a natural uh, sunshine, uh, natural lighting, uh, light. So uh, this technology is benefiting the entire mankind, uh, needless to say, uh, because uh, fossil fuels like uh, uh, coal and uh, petroleum will be exhausted uh, one day uh, while generating uh, emission uh, that harms our livelihood. Solar power used to have a high cost. However, in the past 10 years, with the advancement of technology, the cost has been down to 20% uh, of the original cost. And in the future, this cost is going to be reduced by 50% further. In another 10 years' time, the cost of power and solar power generation will amount to the cost of thermal power. That will make solar energy an important component of the energy mix. And then the next question is, the potential market for the solar power industry is going to be different. In the past, solar power needs to be incorporated into the um, power network, so it has to be approved by the central government. But then if solar power becomes a cheaper form of energy, it will be prev prevalent everywhere. And every place, every corner of the world can uh, see the footprints of polar power, solar power. So we have to minimize solar power. And at the same time, we are working with all the partners to enable further applications of solar power to bring about products that meet the customer's needs. I was giving you an example about Africa, and now we have some ongoing projects with Africa as well. In Africa, there are different kinds of demand, and those forms of demand need energy. However, we have 1.4 billion people in Africa that have no power at all, and it's, it's impossible to put in place a power network overnight. So we're working with African businessmen as to how can we bring together solar power with uh, the applications of energies. We were asking them questions about how to make further innovation, how to provide better solutions to adapt to their need of starting up their own companies and the need of the local people. That's the direction we are working at so that solar power will not only uh, change our current energy supply, but will be more distributed to more people to facilitate their lives. This is a question to any of you, really, as we look at how investment flows work into new technologies. And it's an interesting panel because we have a representative from Africa, we have the United States, as well as China. Does the, the, the the flow of capital across borders into continents basically enable anyone to take advantage of the new waves of technology? Or is it still the traditional basis of investment in Silicon Valley and other places? What do, what do you think, Babylon? 
We still have a, quite a long way to go, definitely, to develop the right kind of venture capital and private equity markets um, on the continent. So we're at the beginning stages now, seeing incubators and the ecosystems growing, so entrepreneurs can get support in developing their business ideas and concepts. Um, but a lot of the time, we'll get to sort of a, a small size sort of rollout. So to get to serious scale does require access to capital. Um, and the underdevelopment of those financial industries, particularly for early stage businesses, um, is, is definitely still a challenge. So we are still struggling to commercialize technologies as a scale we need to get to, to be comparable to, to more developed markets like in Silicon Valley or in Asia here. So there's quite a long way to go. Yeah, I'd say there's certainly discrepancies between access to capital between Silicon Valley, one extreme, <laughs> yeah. where I mean, you're practically being given checks to every, every corner you go to, uh, to I assume in Africa it's much more difficult to have access to capital. And, and why is that? I think a lot of it has to do with uh, rules around intellectual property, but also uh, just what's the exit scenario for an investor? I mean, uh, you know, people don't give you capital uh, usually for social benefit. When venture capitalists give you capital, they want return. And so they need to know how are you get, they going to get an exit uh, from their investment. And what I've heard uh, in the developing world is you know, there aren't bigger companies that are necessarily going to buy that, or there's uncertainty around that. Um, I'm not sure how you address that, but I think it's worth acknowledging that there is a big discrepancy. Well, it's, not, it's not so clear that there's great access to capital in Silicon Valley even for certain kinds of companies, because it became very trendy to focus in on things that have very low capital, you know, very low capital intensity up front. So things like apps and internet companies and a lot of the fundamental research isn't really getting funded that well out of the venture community in, in Silicon Valley. And so I think it does fall to companies like us and some other companies that are large companies that will put huge amounts of money, you know, billions of dollars into fundamental research. When it comes to venture capital, though, I, I generally my sense is that it goes to where the, where the talent is. And, and you know, there was this notion at one point that the world is flat and you can just have anybody anywhere and they sort of all kind of congregate virtually. But the world isn't really flat. I mean, there are big mountains. There's a big mountain in the Silicon Valley of people. There's a big mountain in San Diego around telecom and, and life sciences and, and so forth. And, and what I mean by that is that you have critical masses of people who come together. And, and because you have a critical mass of people in one place, they can run into each other. They can exchange ideas. There can be serendipity and so forth. And it's to those places that I think the, the capital will flow. What's nice now is that instead of talking about the flow of, of, of money, we talk about the flow of human capital and that people get trained in some of the best institutions. And then they go back to their country or in that country, we build up institutions of, of higher education, and therefore, we can create these other places where there's critical masses of people and innovation can occur. One definitely needs um, that kind of critical mass um, to, for, for innovation to, thr to thrive. And it's, I think, one of those things that's important to remember that you can manufacture it. If we look at the fact that Israel's venture capital market really only jump started less than 30 years ago through the sort of schemes that their government set up to incite um, international capital in and provide those tax incentives and de-risk the market essentially. That can be done and there's certainly government, certainly the South African government has the funds to do that if they set up the right structures um, to bring in the skills on the investor side to manage early stage investors. And I think we'd be surprised at the number of, the amount of talent in the African diaspora and on the African continent that would converge once those kind of structures and infrastructure are in place. So we can manufacture it um, if, if we put in the right frameworks. Now, no discussion about prosperity can be complete without talking about jobs and job creation. Net net, are the, it's an overarching term, technology, but does technology create more jobs or does it take it away? Because in my industry, let me tell you, you got to be a one-man band now. You need to edit, you need to shoot yourself, you need to do everything yourself. So the big TV production teams are dwindling, dwindling, dwindling. It's not creating jobs in my industry. How about net net overall? Well, I would say it both creates and destroys. Uh, <laughs> net net, I would say it's a positive. Uh, what I mean by that is like technology empowers uh, companies, individuals. Said another way, uh, technology allows you to do more with less. So the do, more, do, the do more part is great for everybody because it basically decreases the cost of goods and thus everyone can access them more cheaply. Um, and that 
allows a, a, maybe a segment of the population who previously didn't have access to now have access and have a higher standard of living. So that part's very easy. I think the hard part is the uh, with less. So do more with less, right? And so what part of the supply chain is being cut out uh, when we say with less? And with that segment of the population, what happens to them next? Right? We're getting rid of the poor middleman. <laughs> It, yeah, well, right. Don't you so, feel so, sorry for them? So what is the middleman going to do? And, you know, one option is to retrain them, but how realistic is that? Yeah. Uh, there's uh, certainly government programs to provide uh, subsidies, um, but, you know, this is, this is the real issue here, I think. Gao, how about from the Chinese perspective, a manufacturing-based economy trying to move up, up the value chain, but at the same time, you need to keep this masses, the masses, in jobs. Uh, this is absolutely right. A, f a few days ago, I was attending a conference. There was a question raised by a boss from a property company. The question was directed towards the boss of an internet company. He said that the property market has triggered 500,000 jobs. How many jobs have been triggered by the internet, com in internet industry? And the question was not answered by the boss of the internet company. He couldn't answer the question. That led me into the thinking what exactly has done has been done by the new technologies? Have there been new jobs, or are there more jobs being laid off? I noticed that new technologies have actually shaped the way of employment. Let's look at history. 200 to 300 years ago, most of the people in the world uh, worked in agriculture. That was simply because agriculture was the primary source of livelihood. Agriculture provided us with our basic needs. However, nowadays, agriculture workers accounted for a small percentage of the total workforce. Most of the people are working in the industry sector. In the future, more people are going to work in the tertiary sector or the internet sector. On the other hand, China is moving from a manufacturing-based company into a company focused on improving its efficiency. It is being shifted from a, com from, uh, from a country of manufacturing into the country of manufacturing and tertiary sectors. This is going to change our future picture. Um, companies like Alibaba and other internet portals certainly have affected uh, the shopping malls. And perhaps many of the people working there would have to be laid off. Robots are uh, once in place in a large scale will lead to layoffs in the manufacturing factories. So for certain posts, there will be people that will be laid off. However, we must be confident in the past when the industrial age replaced the agricultural age, and there was a new form of so society, and then I believe there will be new employment opportunities in the future. If you look at human history, there has been consistent growth in global population. However, the total number of active working force has been increasing compared with 20 to 10 years ago. So there is no need to fear the potential damage brought about by technologies on employment. However, on an individual or country level, along with the global trend, we need to adapt ourselves to, uh, find, to seeking for new positions. We need to adapt ourselves to the changing trend. Paul, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I would say that the history of technology is the history of human beings making tools for themselves. Mm -hmm. And certainly, every new tool, it may take away something that somebody was doing more manually or now today more, more mentally, but it also creates a platform, going back to what we were talking about earlier, for people to create more. And I think that's, that's where the focus needs to be. Yeah, it is true that as time goes on, some people will have their jobs, the nature of their jobs change, or even be eliminated. But new jobs will be created. And 
there are stats on you know the number of jobs now that are the in the highest demand that didn't even exist you know whatever 10 years ago or five years ago and so um, I think that that is the natural cycle human beings create tools they use those tools to build the next thing including the next tools and so on and so forth and that's that's progress and that creates productivity and improves standards of living and so forth and when we talk about you know having mobile phones you know that has in improved people's lives tremendously and you it's not even that the richest person in the world could have had a mobile phone you know 30 years ago it just didn't exist so these new tools create absolutely new things that you couldn't even have imagined at the time and so i think we're sitting here at a time where there are now tools that will be more mental based tools and worry what will that turn into for human beings i think we need to focus on the fact that it will create new opportunities there are probably a lot of entrepreneurs in the room here tonight or today where should they invest? <laughs> where did you, no, the better question, where should they not invest? <laughs> I would obviously say they should definitely go into the technology space. I mean, if we look at it from the perspective of jobs, it's not as compelling, but we should remember that technology will also open up opportunities in freelance work as well as entrepreneurship. Um, and mm -hmm. lots of young people who might be able to offer some kind of either translation or internet services could be able to just need a desk and a computer, um, internet access, and actually deliver some kind of product to the market. Mm -hmm. And there's all these opportunities for entrepreneurs who could express their creativity and ideas through technology um, that can now start up businesses. So it's not just from the perspective of jobs, but the opportunities that young people would be able to take up um, in freelance work and in entrepreneurship that I would encourage more than anything. Somewhat ironic that we're on a technology panel and we're supposedly getting a lot of social media comments, but oh, yeah. it's gone dead. Maybe somebody can come uh, help me, the Luddite, and we can get a new <laughs> Uh, tablet up here and get I want to get the comments from the cyberspace do you want to some I'll just put it here and you can come creep up it's okay it's live television it's no problem uh, how about <laughs> questions from the audience I've had much worse things happen to me on live TV down here in the front and please keep your questions and visiting professor at Columbia Business School. Uh, this is technology for prosperity, could well become technology for destruction. Um, we have always had seeming disenfranchisement and conflict, and there have been wars, but with today's technology, anybody can learn how to create terrorism or even print a bomb or uh, print a, a, a gun on 3D printers. It is also probably fair to draw a parallel between large-scale terrorism, such as Boko Haram in Nigeria, and the IS in the Middle East, and the ease of learning terror tactics, and making terror weapons, and more importantly, recruiting large scales of volunteers through social media. What, what question is your question, is, sir? Should there be rules about what should be published on the internet, and who should make these rules? Ah, oh, should there be one overarching rule for the internet to prevent some of the things that the gentleman mentioned? Um, I think that will be quite hard to sort of police on the internet given the nature of its openness. And I think I would rather um, defer to the idea that people resort to undertaking negative activity like that when they aren't better or yeah, better economic opportunities for themselves. And the idea with providing internet access and tools for empowerment through the information and reducing inequality is that you're giving people an avenue to add productively to life. And that is, and I believe fundamentally that human beings will pull to that and we rather pull to those options when there isn't much else to go on. Um, and that's really what we see happening with the disenchanted young people that are part of these organizations in general. Um, and censorship is going to be against the principles of the internet. Um, and it's, it's, not, it's not certainly the way I would go with that. Yeah, I, think, I think the notion of trying to have one uniform governance over the internet, which we've had discussions at this forum, seems uh, like trying to have one uniform governance over the world. There are going to be communities that will form and they'll have different interest sets. And sure, there are people who are doing very negative things, but we've also been able to see when those things are happening. I mean, if you look at 
at the ability to uh, keep track of, of those kinds of things and interrupt some of these, these plots. I think that I would argue that things have gone in a better direction now than, than in a negative direction. Um, now, that has other implications, though, and the question is, to what extent are people willing to be surveilled? Those are political questions more than, than technology questions, I would argue, and which goes back to my first point, that I think one, internet governance is also a political question more. We can build technologies to create uh, uh, communities that trust each other and can share information and, and trust that the information coming from one to another is not a negative impact on them. We've been having those discussions uh, here as well. But, but the internet as it stands today, I think, you know, it's really, those issues are more political than technology. And criminal activity is criminal activity. That's and right. There are legal uh, institutions in place to, to tackle that. The other question, though, comes back to uh, censorship. Is that a criminal act? Or is free expression a criminal act? I won't get into that now in this conversation. Any more questions? Yeah, down here. Um, hi, my name is Amit Mehra. I run a business in India called RML. Uh, we provide um, personalized information and uh, marketplace services to farmers uh, on mobile phones. Um, and one of the challenges we have, despite having proven the impact on prosperity of these services, um, is that we are not able to scale as fast as I would like to. So we've reached about 1.5 million farmers, but it's a country which has more than 120 million farming households. So I would love to hear your perspective, Mr. Jacobs and uh, Mr. Blekarek, on um, how best, how quickly one can scale, because it requires a lot of consumer behavior change to adopt these technologies as well. So, yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I think uh, the key thing that we're, we're focused on is getting the cost down as much as possible, getting the coverage out, and, and improving the features. We aren't, we aren't the ones that are building the operating systems and the applications. And I think uh, what you said about making sure that the user interface and the user experience is good so that people have an easier way to, to access these things, um, I would actually put it, put it back on you. I mean, if there are things that we can do to, to make the devices uh, better so that it's easier for somebody to interact with, those are the kinds of things we're very interested in. If the reason why they can't have it is because they don't have coverage, we're working on that as well. But if it's because they don't know how to interface with it, I agree. There's an education aspect and there's also a design of, of the application aspect of it. One of the things that, that happened in our industry was we started out building smartphones and the wireless internet, but it was Apple and Steve Jobs made it a mainstream thing because they combined art and technology and they built this beautiful thing that was easy for people to interface with. The technology had already been there over, uh, you know, had been built over time, but they sort of packaged it up in a way that your average consumer really could relate to. So I would, I would argue it will help, but it's on you too. <laughs> Nathan? To, to address the part of your question around behavioral change, I mean, that's certainly a hard thing. Um, you know, I can relate because Airbnb has only existed six years ago. Six years ago, the idea that you'd let a stranger stay in your home, <laughs> which is kind of mind-blowing, no one thought this would be a big business. Today, on any given night, we have about 400,000 guests staying in other people's homes for the very first time. Uh, so an incredible amount of behavioral change has occurred over six years. I guess what has caused that is social proof. Uh, there's always early adopters. Those early adopters lean in, they take some risk, uh, and if all goes well, others see that, and you lead by example. Um, and so I would say, you know, in this day and age with social media, it's all the more po uh, possible to show social proof and amplify uh, what you're doing to a broader audience. I would assume in Asia it's much more challenging for get hosts to open their their homes, it's not, it's not really a concept like in Europe or in the United States. Are, are you breaking down those barriers in Asia? We are, and, and what's been amazing is that you know, people are more similar than they are different. And what powers us is, is deeply human and uh, transcends different cultures. Uh, and so we're actually seeing our fastest growth now in Asia. How many hosts, is that what you call them? How many hosts do you think you'll have in China in five, 10 years? Well, that's a very hard question. I mean, the nature of exponential growth makes it hard to predict when things double and double and double. Yeah. And it is early days in, 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 Asia, uh, in China specifically. Uh, we're, we're frankly bigger in the other countries surrounding China. But you're optimistic about China. I'm optimistic that Asia uh, and probably China can be our biggest market someday.
Really? By, by volume. Well, just looking at the population, I think. There's your headline right there. Okay. This is called dead air on television. So. <laughs> now it's okay. You're Entertain to say. yourselves. Can you hear me? Okay. Thanks. On the one hand, technology is enabling people to live longer. On the other hand, it seems to be driving jobs towards younger people. What's going to happen, or what can you predict in terms of making it possible for older people to remain active in terms of jobs and so on, uh, with this kind of um, dichotomy? Thank you. Does, yeah, does technology basically wipe out a certain demographic of the workforce? Well, fr uh, frankly, I think this is an opportunity for entrepreneurs. You asked earlier uh, what areas are ripe for investment. Uh, well, what are the problems that no one else is solving right now? Um, and I think certainly there's a huge segment of the population uh, where there hasn't been as much focus in terms of opportunity creation. And when I think about our business, uh, our best hosts on our platform are an older segment. It's the segment that ha whose kids have gone off to college, they have extra space, they have warm hearts, uh, and they make great hosts. Uh, but I must think that there are probably other ways entrepreneurs can empower this segment of the population. Uh -huh. We are unfortunately running out of time. I just want to run down the, the lineup here. If you have any closing comments, since this is really wrapping up the summer Davos, if you will, here in Tianjin this year, which the theme has been based around technology. Everyone wants to know what's it going to look like, the internet or the mobile space in 10 years, maybe in South Africa or in Africa, where maybe people here are not too familiar. We'll have to keep it quick, unfortunately. Okay, great. Um, when I think about sort of the gaps that are stopping us from getting to prosperity through technology, it's really um, also a space where technology can help. So a lot of the times we look at young people and think they don't have the skills, particularly on the continent. And um, through things that my company is doing at Rekindle and many other e-learning companies, upskilling them on mobile devices is also part of that um, message that we need to drive home. And when we use technology to solve those kind of issues as well, we can continue to spread the capacity and include and influence and information that they need to get to participate and become active contributors through that. So um, imagine for me if we could give young Africans access to that empowerment and, and what that changes for the continent. Paul? Uh, you know, the thing that I, I motivate the Qualcomm employees with is the notion that their ideas can impact the world. And that is a huge opportunity, but it's a huge responsibility as well. And the responsibility is to make sure that we do things to improve uh, quality of life and standards of living, whether it's in healthcare or education, public safety, entrepreneurship, all of these areas. And I think that what we'll see over the next five to 10 years is that we'll see the blossoming of this platform, this mobile technology platform, this connectedness, this ability to get access to information into each other. And we're going to see an, a tremendous improvement in people's quality of life. Am I going to have seven devices stuffed down my pants and in my socks? And you're, going to have ones, you're going to have ones in your body, on your body, in the room around you. It's going to be everywhere. The internet of everything. More ways for my wife to track me. So. <laughs> Do you have Do you find? Okay. New technologies today, in internet included, are indeed delivering new wealth and wealth generation uh, for new segments of the population. We have more and more richer people every year, and uh, the new technologies are also bringing about uh, jobs and entrepreneurial opportunities for underdeveloped, underserved populations and regions. That, that's all that it is good. But uh, for new technologies, in essence, they should be geared towards improving the quality of life, towards making us healthier, towards making us happier. Instead of uh, making us look more comfortable on the surface uh, while not having a better life in uh, essence. So I think technologies should make our life happier. That's the right direction to take.
And unfortunately, you're going to be last, and you're going to have to wrap it up quickly. We hit a hard break in about a minute. All right. Yeah, real <laughs> quick. I think 10 years from now, the vast majority of the population will hopefully uh, be connected through the internet, through their smartphones, and whatever device comes next. And I have to believe that that's going to create a lot of new opportunities, uh, particularly for those who aren't yet connected. Um, and I, no one knows what that looks like, um, but I think that will that can only um, improve from where we are today. Great way to wrap up the conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank our <laughs> panelists. Thank you, Nathan. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Father. Thank you very much.